the, the flat rate thing is another thing that bugs me. It's one of them things, it's like, so we come to work and we have no idea what we're going home with at the end of the week. Most techs are probably spending 10 grand a year on new tools. You know, that's without what we should should be calling shop equipment, you know. So we've got no idea what we're going. And then I'm um, listening to these podcasts. I've heard Dutch go, techs can't manage money or anything, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, flat rate tech might not have any idea. What happens if he comes home at the end of the week with a $150 check? It happens. It happens. Hey, everybody. David here, and welcome to the ASOG podcast. When Lucas and I started this podcast, one of our goals was to capture the conversations you tend to have in between sessions at events like ASTE, Vision, or Apex. These conversations are usually candid, completely unfiltered, and almost always eye-opening. No single episode more encapsulates what we wanted to capture than this episode with Sean Tipping of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast, which you can check out at autodiagpodcast.com, and former shop owner and now automotive diagnostician extraordinaire, Adrian Lowe's. This turned out to be a very long conversation, and so we're going to break this up into two episodes. But before we get started with this one, please take a moment to hit that like button if you're watching this on YouTube. And if you like our content, consider subscribing to the channel. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast listening app, make sure you're set to automatically download the latest episode so you never miss an upload. Now, here we go. What sets you off, Adrian? Let's start there. Yes. Oh, what sets me off? There's a whole bunch of stuff sets me off. And, uh, I mean, obviously, I'm now a tech. I've been a shop owner. I've seen both sides of it. And, um, I mean, you see some of these posts about, you know, the can't get the staff, you know, tech shortage and everything. Um, yeah, there probably is a tr skill trade shortage. Um, there is worldwide. And it's been like this for a few years now. Uh, it's many things. It's not just pay, but I believe pay is actually a big factor because at the end of the day, no one goes to work just to be told, well done, you've done a great job. You know, you got to work to get paid to feed your family, you know. Um, however, being a business owner side, yeah, you can understand if the techs are not good enough, they don't deserve to be paid top dollar. Um, so it's very chicken and egg. Now, I'll start with when I was shop owner looking to employ people. You know, I was on these Facebook groups like Mario's, Cody's, all these different tech groups. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, these are what normal techs are like. And I couldn't find anybody like that. I'm like, you know, what do you do when you use a scope to do this? And they look at you and like, what? A what? <laughs> they have no idea. You know, they didn't understand what data pids were on a scan tool. And I... I was thinking this was what all techs should know as standard. But it turns out they didn't. So I can see why a guy may turn 80 hours a week, but if he can't diagnose out his way out of a paper bag, then to be honest with you, a guy that could turn 80 hours a week changing ball joints, you can find a lot of them compared to the skilled people, which is what I think people are struggling to find. You didn't find that having just saying that, well, I can find somebody to replace ball joints, but I've had that mindset as well. And I found that those guys that just do ball joints break a lot of things and aren't doing ball joints properly. Like you walk by and go, Hey, uh, you're going to use a torque wrench on that, right? I've never used the torque wrench before. And you're like, what? Seriously? I had one guy, uh, he came in and interviewed and I remember this so distinctively. He was an older guy. He wanted, uh, he, he had a very specific salary demand. He's like, I will only work for salary and it has to be a minimum of this much. Otherwise I'm not even going to consider the position. And I said, okay, well we can talk about that. And we started discussing some of the habits and traits that he had as a technician. And one of the things was I mentioned that, Hey, we, we go, we cinch down the wheel with a torque stick. And then we set the wheel down and then we go around with a 
an actual torque wrench. And he goes, well, I don't need to do that. I've been doing this for, you know, X amount of years. And I go, well, what do you do? He's like, well, I know my Cornwell impact really well. And I know that if I just zip it down and I can hit that spot, I know by feel that I'm hitting about 80 to 100 foot pounds. And I go, okay, well, if the torque spec is 84 foot pounds, it's pretty specific, like for a reason. No. And he's like, yeah, but I'm going to be get really, really close. And it's, a lot of guys have uh, tested me and they've come back behind me and have tried to click the, um, or put the torque wrench on it to see if I actually hit the spot. And I always do. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> we can talk about so, that. I'm going to need you to use a torque wrench if you're going to come work for me. <laughs> we do a thing in the college with the students uh, with torque wrenches. Obviously, we show them how to use it. But in my engine class, and I'm talking how important it is to, we got to torque these fasteners. You can't guess on a head bolt. You got to do this the correct way. So we take a torque wrench. It's an electric one. And I... I cover the uh, screen, the digital screen on the torque wrench so they can't see it as they're pulling the bolt and I have it set to a certain torque. And the goal is for them to get as close to whatever it is, we're doing 50 pounds as possible without going over and it beeps when you go over or you basically hit 51, it beeps at them. And so I have them all go through and see who can get closest with going over and they're, most of them go over, most of them over estimate what they're pulling or they're really weak because they can say when they'll be like well that's 50 pounds and they're way off and occasionally somebody will get close but i whoever gets closest i, I buy them lunch but uh, the the goal is to show them that, like you can't guess on this stuff you got it yeah. you got it you no, no, you're right you can't guess on talk stuff you know you really can't so those r and r guys those b techs or whatever you want to call them they end up being hacks at the end of the day and there's plenty of them sure that have quote unquote worked on cars for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever they want to say, but 10, 15, 20 years of doing it wrong doesn't make you any better a technician. And, and so what do you do then? Like you can't even find an R and R guy that uh, is willing to do things properly. Well, I mean that, that then comes down to the strengths and the procedures and processes you have in the shop, you know, um, because it's like the guy says, you know, I can do it with this and this and this. Like, if I'd started, like when I start my shop and my boss says, I want you to do this, this way. Okay. Why? Because that's how he wants it done. So you do it that way. It's not really that complicated, is it? You know, how could But are you not- saying that now that you've been a shop owner, though, and you've had that experience where you're like... I'm putting, I'm putting this procedure in place because we've ran into this situation before and we know that if we follow this procedure, we minimize incidents. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, yes, but like specifically, you know, lug nuts, it's a case of, you know, I always used to talk them up in my shop and I'm expected to talk them up in the shop I'm at now, you know, I'm expected and the shop I was at previously, people some people are gunning them, some people are talking them. And, you know, I'm like, why is there not a set procedure that all lug nuts should be talked? You know, you've gone from, I've gone from one pl- one shop and I've read all the stuff on ASOG. I've got other friends that are shop owners. And I look, listen to them and they talk about you need procedures for this. And uh, so I'm like, okay, you come up with some procedures and policies. And then obviously, you know, I closed my shop and I went to work for someone else. And you realize they don't have these. And this is why they're not like some of the shops you see, you know. Like the last shop I was at, they were doing a million a year. They were, were not a wealthy shop at all. They weren't doing a million in profit or a million and making a net 20, say. They were making, say, a net four, four or five. So they had no policies to get them to where they should be at with that sort of revenue, you know, but back to the technician side of it, it's a technician's job is pretty much to do what the owner of the business requests them to do. You know, what about the prima donnas though? (laughs) I've had plenty of them. I've, I've interviewed plenty of them. They come into the shop and they're like, I've been doing this a long time. You're like, okay. 
I still need you to do it this way though. And then, you know, then there's friction there or they don't come work for you because they have this like set way. Is it a case of that? They've been at so many shops that haven't done things properly, or at least a standardized way that when they show up at your shop, all of a sudden there's, you know, some pushback. It could very well be that. I mean, I could be a little bit of a prima donna on some things, but I mean, there's room for discussion. You know, I mean, sure. like you say, I want it done this way. Well, how about we do it this way? Because, you know, this way will give us a quicker result and we'll know whether we need to be doing that or not. You know, something, something as similar as a compression test, you know. But it's like, do we really need to know what the numbers are or can we do a quick relative compression test, take five minutes, boom, then we know we've got to do something have a bit more deeper. Answer, yeah. You know. Well, you know, if you look, there's a there's a comment I made to a reply in a previous podcast to Edwin just a few minutes ago where I'm kind of talking about the fact that, like, technicians have to work with the owners, right? That's something that I think we keep missing is is that it's like we're against each other. And, and, and many times we see shop owners who are frustrated and pissed off with their technicians, and then we see uh, technicians who are pissed off and frustrated with their owners. And, and I guess my perspective is, how can we better work together to to ease that pain, if you will, right? Like, why does it have to be we're against each other? Why can't we work together and say, hey, listen, this thing we've been doing in the shop, it hasn't been working. That's what we do in our shop, right? Now, there's standards we've set that you have to meet these standards. This is how we expect things to be done. This is the process we've put out. Well, that doesn't work. Okay, well, let's talk about it as a team. Ah, I see what you're saying. Let's do that differently. Why doesn't that happen in other shops? I mean, what what's the holdup? Why why does that never become part of the conversation? I don't know. I can tell but, you the, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go on, Sean. Yeah. Oh, uh, so I can tell you some of the shops I go into doing my mobile thing uh, where I'm doing diagnostics and stuff, and you can tell that they don't have these procedures in place. They don't have... I mean, there's, there's normal day operations and they just keep going through the motions, but it's not a set procedure. There's nothing written out or explained to them. This is how this needs to happen. So we don't run into this issue. Right. And you can just tell. Um, and honestly, I feel like the guys who are just scrambling to try to keep the lights open, they don't even have the time to think about creating something like that. They're just running as fast as they can from fire to fire to try to put out, yeah. you know, each thing that's getting messed up or broken or whatever it might be the problem they're trying to solve at the time. And I mean, I see more of this because those are the shops that I'm servicing, right? Those are the right. shops that are calling me in for diagnostics, but I don't even, I don't even think they've had the time to sit down and consider making something like that and how it could benefit them. So I think, some of the solution would be is <laughs> how do we reach and help people like that, that are struggling? But, you know, they might not have the time to figure everything out because they're fighting fire to fire. But like Lucas said, you know, if you had a discussion as a team, it would be the owner doesn't need to have the time because he could turn around and say, right, I want you three to go and figure out what's the best way we can have to check in cars so we don't miss damaged parts or we don't miss a cracked windshield or figure something out, how we can work something out or come up with something, you know what I mean? So yeah, everyone's involved in, and everyone sort of had an agreeance on it, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I think that that, that creates multiple different levels, right? We, we get buy-in for one. Yep. And that's important to me because I, I want my staff to understand this is just as important to them as it is to me, right? I, I want them to care. They're their clients. And Sean just left. I wonder if his internet's bad. I don't know. There he is. He's back. Can you hear me? Cool. All right. So I don't need to message you. All right. Where were we? What were we talking about? We we're talking about stuff and stuff. So in, in, um, Adrian was just said talking about having a team meeting and having some type of uh, feedback right. or a way to, to give feedback and not have the owner have to come up with all the answers. Um, I, I don't know. Some, I think sometimes it's just the owner not, uh, not identifying that there is even a problem. Right. But you were about right. to say well, Lucas. 
You know, I I, I agree with that. I, I think that I think, you know, we always hear that the, the technicians always seem to look at the owner or the, the service writer as a problem. Right. And I don't necessarily think that it's there a problem. I think they just don't know any better. Right. They don't they don't they don't see what they don't see. They don't know what they don't know. So there's no way to to make it better if you don't even recognize it. And I, I was in that loop for a long time. Um, and so like now the guys come in here and they're like, Hey, we've got a problem with this. Okay, go fix it. <laughs> what do you want me to do about it? You know, and, and obviously it's not like that. I, I take care of their needs. We we do our very best to make sure that we are part of the, the solution, not part of the problem. But I guess my point is is that they need ownership of the problems and the solutions. If, if if ownership solves all the problems, the technician never realizes they have the power to solve the problem. In the same respect, it's the same for the owner. If they continually put everything else on, or every problem, everything that comes up on someone else, they always look at, I don't have the solution, it's Bob, right? So I think it has to be a very team built aspect that we're going to work together to solve this. It's not somebody's fault. It's not something that happened that somebody caused. This is a, a team and we're going to solve the team's problems as a team. Well, right? look, look at the, uh, the example he gave though. He said the check-in process, check-in slow, or yeah. they miss a crack windshield and the technician may come to the to owner and say, Hey, if we do it this way, we're not going to miss the cracked windshield next time. Right. What does the owner do with that? Sure, let's try it. Right? I mean, worst case scenario, what what happens if we try it? You know, I'm going to be honest. I mean, I came from a big corporate world in Britain, actually the largest airport company in the world. Um, And we had engineering directors coming down, and they were like, right, this is what we need to do. How do you guys think this is – think would – what would you guys think would be the best way to do it? That was their first thing. It was literally like almost, if we get you to come up with the ideas, you're not going to complain about doing them. Right. Yeah. And they're going to get done probably, you know? That's very true. That's And it's, true. it's a very, a very different mindset I've noticed over there than it is here, you know, but it's it's what they call the upside down triangle. So the guy at the pinnacle is actually at the bottom. That's what they say. You know, that's corporate jargonology for you. But you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, go ahead, David. No, no, go ahead and go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, like, you know, if if we look at it from that sense, right, and and maybe maybe we start at the technician, right? And we say the, the number one thing we want to accomplish is the wheel doesn't fall off the car, right? That, that's the most important thing we have to come up with. How do we accomplish that? And we work back from that and the technician gives his input and then the service advisor gives his input and the, the owner and the QC tech and the whole nine yards. I, I think that the process has to involve everyone for the simple fact that you know, like the service advisor, we were talking today, we had a situation where the quality control technicians both started working on a car because they didn't realize they had other cars to work on that they could have been doing two at the same time. And we found that the service advisor did not know part of the process. And even though we've talked about it, we've trained on it the whole nine yards, he missed that little part of the process. And that one part of the process not only caused time, but it caused frustration. And it was just a simple little fix. We talked about it. We worked it out as a team and said, hey, here's how we'll do this next time. So I think that building those processes as a team kind of gives everybody ownership, like you said, Adrian. It's very important that they have ownership of the solution because it's theirs. They came up with it. They talked about it. They worked through it. Now, what do you do when you get a technician who shouldn't be part of the solution? (laughs) Is that bad to say? Like, you know, Adrian, you've seen me make post about the one technician I had. I mean, this dude, he wasn't going to do DVIs and he wasn't going to torque bolts and he didn't care about the quality. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> clearly the answer is firing, right? I that, mean, that's just what we're um, supposed to I do. I mean, but. yeah, that's, that, that becomes, that's just not an employee. You know, it's, uh, right. 
it's like, you know, I've always been a European guy, but I'm lucky that I don't have to work on Cadillac North Stars, but I could quite easily say I don't do them. (laughs) That would be a wise statement. If my boss says, my friend's bringing one in, fix it, guess what? I've got to fix it, you know? (laughs) Right. Right. That's very true. So, I mean, how do, how do you approach the the situation that you found yourself in, Adrian, working at that other shop that was doing a million plus and was probably not netting very much? And I, I remember some of your posts when you moved into that shop, and I remember some <laughs> of the conversations you had about they don't have this tool, they don't have this, they have no idea how to deal with this, they can't diagnose anything. And, I mean, so you those those shops could be taking in technicians, maybe young technicians, because that's probably what they're attracting, people that don't know any better, right? They don't know the difference between a good shop and a bad shop. They don't know the difference between a well-equipped shop and a shop that doesn't care um, or doesn't know the importance of being well-equipped. And so they come into the field, maybe they gain some competence doing ball joints or whatever, and hey, how do you want me to diagnose this problem with this car? I don't have a scan tool. The service information says I have to have this special tool or that, this, that, and the other. Maybe they haven't learned how to problem solve, and then they get run off. They're like, man, screw this. I mean, I'm making 15 bucks an hour to deal with all these problems. You know, the, the HVAC company is offering 30, and the systems are much simpler. They're going to provide me tooling and a van. I don't have to deal with this garbage. And then they're off. I, no, yeah, you're, you're exactly did, did right. Did you see I mean, that happen? Uh, no, because, I mean, they had one guy who was, he was an okay parts changer. Um, they had another guy who was an okay parts changer. Um, I was trying to explain to him about using scopes for diags and what have you. One of the lads started to, show an interest and then that was it the other guy didn't even blink an eyelid um i still speak to the owner of the shop now i'm friends with him uh they've got a new guy in there now who i've known for years um he's fantastic tech he really is wanting to learn scopes pushing the owner to buy a pico the owner's thinking about it i'm actually looking at holding a basic how to set a scope up class how to test for injector pulse, how to check for compression test, how to check cam and crank correlation, blah, 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 blah. Just simple things, you know, the, get them on the, on the road to learning, you know. Um, he said, yeah, come in, do it, you know, blah, blah. I said, you know, I'll come in, do your shop for free. We'll get a couple of other shops in, maybe charge them, what have you. And he said, no, 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 we've got to pay you and everything, you know, blah, blah. Um, the pay was okay, but it was flat rate. And, uh, you know, we had a couple of, or I don't know, a week or so where it was, uh, we had a hurricane. Now, imagine what that does to your flat rate pay structure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the flat rate thing is another thing that bugs me. You know, it's, <laughs> it really does. You know, it's one of them things. It's like, so we come to work and we have no idea what we're going home with at the end of the week. No and yet we're still expected to buy. Most techs are probably spending 10 grand a year on new tools. Yeah. You know, that's without what we should, should be calling shop equipment, you know? Right. Um, so we've got no idea what we're going. And then I'm um, listening to these podcasts. I mean, Dutch go, techs can't manage money or anything, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, flat rate tech might not have any idea. What happens if he comes home at the end of the week with a $150 check? Well, it happens. I mean, it, it, yeah, happens. it really does. I've, I've talked to techs that that's happened to, right? And good techs, not like lousy, sorry techs, like good techs that have come home with. with I remember that techs. happened to a diagnostic specialist in North Carolina once. He posted on Facebook and he was at a dealer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so I, I, I have seen that happen. I've talked to people that that's happened to. I've got shops around me that pay their guys like 15 bucks an hour. Right. <laughs> and, and that's, they call them their technician. And I, I watched one shop bring in a guy and they're like, Hey, you ever changed oil before? Yeah. 
All right, you're our new technician. <laughs> what? Come on now. Um, Good and, Lord. And I, I was literally standing there for the conversation. And and you can tell in the quality, right? And I, I think it sucks because it gives us all kind of the same image, right? We all end up looking bad. Um, but in so many different ways, I think if we're going to fix it, a good techs have to leave bad shops. They, they can't stay there. They can't continue to do that or they've got to help them fix it. If they don't know, I mean, how do we start that conversation? Because you've been on both sides of it, Adrian. Yep. How do we start the conversation that says, Hey, listen, um, I've got some concerns with the shop. Now it's not your shop, right? Mm -hmm. now, I would be open if my guys came to me and said, Hey boss, we've got some concerns. Cool. Let's talk about it. We need to look at the financials. What do we need to do? Cool. Um, but how do you start that conversation? How do you begin to build that from your perspective, Adrian? It's very difficult because you don't want to be that, um, oh, I used to do it this way, guy. You know, I used to do it this way. I used to do it this way. You, you don't want to be that guy. Um, it's very hard because a lot of owners don't want to hear it. You know, they simple as fact, they don't want to hear it. Um, but, I, I, I mean, it's a very difficult conversation to have um it's where the owner as the leader needs to approach people and say look i'm having a problem with this what do you guys think because chances are majority of shop owners out there have got technicians who've worked at other shops right or they've worked at big dealers or wherever and he says look we've got a problem with this xyz how do we deal with this one guy could say oh when when i was at the dealer we used to do this Oh, when I was at this shop, we used to do this. Somewhere in the middle, that's probably a pretty good answer. You know, so it's rather than the owners sort of like sitting at the helm and going down with his sinking ship, you know, he sort of needs to start asking for screaming for help, you know? You think it's an ego thing? You think it's that, that we're just so proud and so arrogant that we're unwilling to be like, hey, I need help. And and is it possible that, that guys look at it and they say, if I ask for help, that's a sign of weakness? I mean, do you think that that plays a part into it? I don't know if that's – I mean, it probably does have some part in play, you know, to play for it. But, I mean, when it's your business, it's uh, – you've got to put – Pride and ego aside, really, haven't you? You know, when it's yeah. every, every you should. I don't think that happens, though. I don't think that's the case. I, I think a lot of guys open and gals, although I don't think it's a, uh, um, I don't think you'd, it'd be as prevalent if it was mostly women running these shops. I, for whatever reason, I just, I don't think I've met a one. No, I shouldn't say that. I have, I know I've met at least one that probably was causing more problems than helping. But um, I, I think it is an ego thing. I think that the shop owners show up and they expect that I'm a know-it-all and, uh, you know, I, I have got all the solutions and I'm going to do things my way and it's my way or the highway. And, you know, if they run into a problem, I don't think they're that uh, quick to, to ask for help of their staff specifically, if that makes sense. Or is that... Or is that a thing from their environment? They've been at shops where they've never, they've always been treated like you're just a tech, go and work. I'll, you know, they've never been asked for help and they've watched that other business fail in effect, you know, and they think, I'll do it my way because my way is going to be better. Is yeah, why, and, and why are they David like talks that? talks about that all the time. You know, and that, that David talks about the cycle, right? And, and how this keeps happening over and over again, you know, and it's like, how do you, Great, we know that it happens, but how do we stop it? You know, what? what is the next? Because it keeps happening, right? The cycle keeps happening. The, the texts keep ending up in the same shitty position. How do we eventually stop it? Like, what what is it going to be that breaks the cycle? If nothing else, for four or five shops that are listening, what, what are the tools that we can put on the ground that say, here's how we're going to stop this? I think... A lot of shops, they've got no vision of what they want to be, if that makes any sense. Yes, so that they, they, they have no idea how to get there because they don't know where they want to get to. That's 99.9% .9 of shops, though. You know, I mean, I remember s sitting there at my shop going, okay, I want to be 
like Seth. That's what I want. I want to be like his shop. That's what I want my shop to be like. Because not three or four locations, just one of them. But, you know, but we're a European shop. We just want to specialize in Europe. Boom, doing that. And I went did a uh, training class for his dad in Miami. Fantastic class. Um, we ended up staying up drinking afterwards at the bar. I learned more at the sitting drinking, talking to Seth and Frank Capelli after the training class than I learned in the training class. Yeah, I've, I've definitely been in that scenario a time or two. You know, but I, I knew where I wanted to be going towards. How, how many know where they want to be going towards? The, you you wanted the, the Taj Mahal building and, like, you know, the polished floors and the... Have you ever seen the lobby of Frank's shop? Yes, that's what I want. I It's gorgeous, I, I, isn't it? This is going to bring on to another thing of mine. Um, it's Lucas mentioned about the image technicians and we're all getting started to say tired with the same image. Um, I had a young tech come and work for me. You know, he used to work at AutoZone. He wanted jobs. So I gave him a little job. You know, come work for me. It's like GS type thing. And I ended up taking him to the Jaguar dealer with me to go and get to go and pick up some parts. And I said, go and look at the shop. He's like, oh, wow, it's amazing. Look at that. I said, now look at the technicians. He's like, none of them are dirty. And I was like, yeah, they've probably got two or three shirts. They get changed because, you know, they don't, they look, want to look professional. Everyone's got their shirt tucked in. And it's like, yeah. why is that not common practice? Ask Reed Ratchet and Wrench, and they'll be top shop, whatever, and they'll show the team that guys are in jeans. And it's like, come on, really? I mean, people talk about comparing ourselves to doctors. When was the last time we went to doctors who was in jeans or in a shirt untucked? Yeah. There's some out there. It doesn't come off pretentious, though. I mean, I, I, I don't think I could do that. I don't, I don't think I could, I don't know, force that. I mean, my guys are in uniform, and they've got, you know, signed shirts and pants. And, you know, you if I have one tech, he keeps ripping his shirts, and he will wear that ripped shirt. And I'm like, hey change your shirt like come on quit coming into work with that shirt on it, it you know it look it doesn't look good um but I, I don't know like we have we have a jaguar land rover slash porsche mercedes they, they sell all of the luxury brands all in one location that place is just it, it's pretentious it's smug it, i don't know and and those customers the customers that go in there they definitely uh want that feel and, um, I, I don't know. I just, that's not my personality and I, I couldn't be in an environment like that. Like, I'm, I guess I'm too goofy. I'm too unprofessional. I'd, you know, I'd, I'd say the wrong thing. Um, yeah, I just, I couldn't do it. Now, do you want to go to a five star hotel or do you want to go and start motel six? Yeah, but this has to be a like, happy medium. Like I'm okay at the Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> okay it's but high it's in restaurants with david it's not it's not listen you're not going to get in with hotels you talk about a mission <laughs> that, restaurant different, now, hold that's on, a whole that, different, that's different now i it the the if the restaurant if you're going for a one-time experience then yeah i mean i'm going to go to the michelin rated restaurant and i'm i'm okay dropping a thousand bucks on the meal i have no problem with that but I know that's going to be a one-time, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be looking for that every single time. And most of the time I'd rather just cook at home. And so that, that's what I'm talking about. Like I, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the home cooking at my shop. And yeah, if you want the Michelin rated restaurant, that's got the microgreens and foam and it's 250 bucks for that plate. But you know, it, it's just a one bite experience, quote unquote experience, right? Um, and it's two hundred fifty bucks for that one plate, but it'll blow your 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 socks off on how it tastes. Then go for it. And, but if you want that every single time, it's like okay, well then I'm not for you. I have you know, we we serve biscuits and gravy at our restaurant, <laughs> and that's what you get. They're really good biscuits and gravy. They're fantastic biscuits, but it, they're biscuits and gravy. You can't frou frou that up. Like you, it's, you, you can only get so fancy with that. And so I'm not going to charge 250 bucks for the plate. And so, and, and but that that has everything to do with my personality. I mean, yeah, you're I, building I, a brand new shop, Lucas. Is that 
how, what's well, what's the look, shop going to look? I'm making my brand How's new shop feel? look like a big red barn, right? And and I I do plan to improve in some of those areas, right? There's some exterior appearances and some work areas that I have no choice but them looking like they look now with this shop that when I move into the new shop, that's going to improve. But I was sitting here thinking about this as you guys talked and I'm kind of feeling bad about myself. Like, uh, we don't always tuck our shirt in. We don't, you know, like, um, I'm, I'm judging myself here and, oh man, there's that big stack of tires down there and it looks kind of gruddy. Um, and, and we work to clean those things up. But one of the things, you know, while we're on the restaurant kick, one of the things that's really important to me when I think about going to a restaurant to eat, is consistency, right? And there's this great little restaurant in my town called Tucker's, and it's been there f- since the early 90s. It's in the mall, and it's not some super special restaurant, right? It's not got all this jazz or anything else, but the one thing it always has is absolute consistency. You go in, and they seat you really quick, and they take your order really quick, and the food tastes the same way it tasted last time, and it's never cold or hot or what, you know, it's the way it's supposed to be, and it's always very, very consistent. And that, for me, is important. And I think that's one of the areas that has made my shop more successful than it was in the past is that we we put processes and policies in place that made us consistent right is that a euro and thing you think it could very well be um but i think it should be all shops i mean why not it's i mean is it pretentious or is it professionalism yeah well, where's the, the line the restaurant where's thing the, too yeah that's the that's the thing that's where's the line what's that shop oh i, I was gonna say on the restaurant the side of things too. I mean, one of the things I really appreciate is just the good service, right? I can go up to a little bar up the street and the bartender and the waitresses, they take really good care of us. It's not a fancy five star. It's not my style either. That's not the thing I go for, but we go there every time because they take care of us and they're personable and we feel welcome there. And I got to imagine, you know, if I'm bringing my car to somewhere, you know, to get repaired, that's something that's really going to mean something me too. Maybe it doesn't look like the fancy Mercedes shop with the white floors and everything, but they're good, taking good care of me. They're, they're, um, you know, connecting with me as a customer. I'm going to want to go back there. I think that that can be something that, you know, maybe a, a, a smaller shop can offer without the, <laughs> without all the amenities that a, a big fancy Porsche dealership could, you know, I totally agree with that, but my issue is, you know, every Facebook group, every, you know, all the podcasts, everyone's like, we need to be more professional. We need to be treated with more respect. We need to, you know, we should be looked the same image as, you know, doctors, lawyers, and what have you, because we're professionals. And But until we're actually looking like them, we're never going to be treated. Like them. And acting like them, we're never going to be treated the same. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, I can see image that. is I, I everything. See, I see your argument. I really do. I really do. I just, I just don't know, like, like we were just saying, I don't, I don't know the happy medium because I don't know. Like, um, I, I know that I, um, rather than looking at it as a, we should be the same as doctors and lawyers. I, I think that's a bad analogy, but I can definitely see the restaurant thing and I, I don't want to be the dive and for sure. Right. But I, I know, I don't think I can push to get to the point that we are um a michelin rated type place and and you got to think like the guys that are doing that the 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 people that are that are pushing their restaurants to that level they're making a lot of sacrifices they're putting in a ton of work and it's a it's a it's a little mixture of business acumen and genius and I don't think a lot of people have that. They, they're just, they don't have the skill or the talent. Maybe they can get the skill, but the talent may not be there. I don't know. There's that, there's that, uh, Hong Kong joint. The guy just serves chicken for lunch here. You guys know what I'm talking about? No, no. He, so uh. he won a Michelin star. He serves chicken and it's, a, it's like a, a lunch stand. But people line up for hours to get his chicken. I'm not. I'm not kidding. Look it up, and it, it, it's it's like three dollars for his plate. But it was so good. 
that that they awarded him a Michelin star. It's in Hong Kong, and uh, and again, people line up for hours, and you almost want to just. I know what I can do, and I'm going to do it as well as I can possibly do it. And it, yeah, I think that does mean being a certain level of professional. But I'm going to focus in on what I do extremely well, and some of that is just cutting up with customers. You know, being goofy and, you know, being goofy in my, in my marketing and having my kids in my marketing and, you know, having a silly website and, you know, make, may, maybe not making it as serious as say Frank shop, you know, you go to Frank shop and everything looks clean, pristine, crisp, you know, everybody, like you're saying, it, it gives that vibe. And I'm not to, not to say that his place is pretentious. I don't think that's the case, but it, it gives off a certain vibe that I just, it's not my personality. So I just w- would fail at it miserably, even if I tried it, even if I just said, I'm going to do this <laughs> to the nth degree, to the, to, to the best of my ability. I'm not kidding. I just, as soon as I see the opportunity, I just, I wouldn't be able to swallow the joke and I, you know, <laughs> I'd say something that you shouldn't say, and it, ah, screw, oh, I guarantee, I screwed I it up. I guarantee. <laughs> oh, I'd love and, it. And you know, here's the thing: is that I, I don't. I think there's more than one way to bring consistency and professionalism, right? I I don't think it has to fit the same mold in every single shop. But I I think you know, for instance, I'll <laughs> I'll never forget this: the the tech that I always tell the stories about that I had problems with. The second day he worked for me, I asked him to go move a vehicle out of the parking lot and I should have fired him and I knew I should have fired him. And I, I, I still to this day say to myself, why didn't you fire him right then and save yourself all the trouble? This guy goes flying through the parking lot wide open. And as he does it, he's passing the client that owns the vehicle he's in. And he's like raising cane in this person's vehicle, right? So, Sean, if you could please make sure you teach your students that. Please, <laughs> please don't do that in a client's vehicle. If you want to do that in your own vehicle, fine. Um, but I guess my point is, is the little things like that that we can do, properly treating a client's vehicle. Maybe we don't tuck our shirt in, but we wear clean clothes, right? We We show that we're professional. We show that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing with the client's vehicle. We, we make sure we're being consistent in the repairs and the documentation. We're explaining things clearly, right? That's so important to my clients. When I ask them and I talk to them and I say, hey, you know, what's important? What do you like about this shop? You're so transparent with me and you're honest and you tell me the things that I need to know. Okay, Tell me about it. Well, those notes, you told me what testing you did. You told me what the problem was and and what that result was. And you explained exactly what I needed to do next. Think about that for a minute. If that alone can add that much professionalism, how important is that? Right? It doesn't Um, have to be that the professionalism is is set in stone. You got to do this. You got to do that. Be professional in your own way, but be consistent. Do you, uh, this is for, I guess all three of you, cause you've run shops. Do you have your technicians talk to directly to your customers? Is that a regular thing that you do? Because that's an area where I've tried to focus in with my students is to be able to at least have that professional communication level with somebody that you can explain somebody without dropping the F bomb three times or, <laughs> you know, look presentable. Even when you're talking to a customer, I think that's an important thing to be able to do as a technician to add to that professionalism. So I, what do you guys do in your shop? I, I don't know that I would worry about the F bomb, but I'd worry about them calling things junk. Like, hey, your vehicle's <laughs> junk. Okay. This is the okay. worst so vehicle I, I've ever. <laughs> I was on the phone with somebody because I used to sell my own tickets as a tech, and um, I I would always call Ford Explorers Ford Exploders. That was just our oh, lingo, yeah. and I said it on the phone to the customer that I was trying yeah. to sell the work your to. Exploder. I was like, I got your Ford Exploder here. I was your like, ah, oh, shoot. <laughs> This so, crap, yeah. what's up with this crap a lack? And customers standing in the <laughs> lobby you can hear it. You're like, ah, oh, geez. That, that, yeah, that, that would be the biggest issue. But, you know, I, I we, we've had Andrew uh, Minkler on the, um, on the podcast and he absolutely has his technicians talk to the customer. It's a, it's a trust thing. And he, he trains his technicians on how to say things and how to present things to the customer. And, 
I, I don't know. It just, um, what, what do you think, Adrian? Is that, is that like the next I, level of professionalism? No, I had my technicians speak to customers all the time because there may be little intricate issues that I didn't know when I was, you know, selling the job that the tech could say, oh, yeah, we noticed this, this, and this, you know, that could be the cause of that. Uh, but yeah, now I speak to customers daily, every day. You know, they literally you customer the phone up. You've got a crutch. Like, what the crap? Yeah, especially as we you, work you think lap. Lucas is working at a Land Rover shop. You think Lucas said, hey, ma'am, uh, you're a Land Rover <laughs> over here, and there's something wrong with the air suspension. And uh, it's like, do you think they would instill confidence? Not to make fun of Lucas. I'm just, I'm just saying that the, the, the accent, the, the inflection of the voice, the way you have to say things, you're in a Land Rover shop. It would make sense. The guy with the British accent walks up, starts talking to you. I don't care who you are. If you're in the States and you hear that, you're like, it doesn't matter if the guy's entirely incompetent. I trust that he knows what he's doing. Yep. It just listen the, the, to the way he talks. And so <laughs> I would use you absolutely. Like you'd be on the phone with every single one of my customers. Hold on. Let me talk to Have you talked to the expert? Hey, Adrian, talk to this person. Yeah, it's and I used to do it all the time. I used to, I used to do a lot of Jaguars at my place, and people would come in. Oh, do you work on Jaguars? Yes. Oh, you're English. Yeah. Oh, of course you work on Jaguars. Yeah. Oh, you've got the right <laughs> place, you know. And I mean, it's you mean Jaguars? <laughs> <laughs> at least you didn't say Jaguar. There's no I in it. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it does work. It does work. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the ASOC podcast. If you'd like to catch these episodes early, including part two for next week, you can do so by becoming a patron. Just go to ASOC.site and click on the Become a Patron Now button. Becoming a patron helps support the show, gets you several perks, and is tax deductible. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast and on YouTube so you never miss any upcoming episodes, including part two. And as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, shoot me an email. My email address is david at asog.site. That's D-A-V-I-D at A-S-O-G dot S-I-T-E. Until next time. 